Welcome back everyone. Today I want to do something that's a little more laid back for a change. I want to have a conversation, a little dialogue, a little back and forth. I want to talk about photography. I want to do a little philosophical thing, get back to the roots of the art of photography and talk about what it is that we're trying to do with our chosen art form, how we're trying to better ourselves, improve ourselves, what we're getting out of this. And I have a couple things in mind that I want to talk about, but I think it's about time we open up this kind of conversation. So there is no doubt that this year has been the strangest year I have experienced in my lifetime, and I think that this has impacted everyone on some level. And I'm going to be very open and candid about this, but about April or May-ish of this year, when things were in lockdown, I started to get to where I was really starting to battle depression internally. I was really kind of just didn't feel like doing anything. It's a certain sadness, uh, a bit of confusion, but just being down all the time. And I was very uncomfortable with that, and I decided to make some changes moving forward. But, but looking at that, I was trying to figure out why. For the last two years, my career in this channel has changed to the point where I was doing a lot of traveling in 2018, 2019. In fact, by last year, I was traveling at least once a month, and there were more than a couple months that had multiple trips. And so that became part of my workflow. It was something that, you know, that was how I worked. I was doing a lot of traveling, and then therefore my own photography, I was relying on being able to go somewhere to shoot something. And this whole misconception that I think a lot of people struggle with with, but your own surroundings, your own home, your own neighborhood, your own city for that matter, because we see them all the time, it becomes a little mundane, maybe a little too boring for us old hat. We see it the same way. And so it's something we're less inspired to photograph. So we become reliant on being able to go somewhere or find something unusual or different to photograph. And I think that's actually a mistake that we all make. But I've talked about this before and I've thought about it in my own work that I produce, whether that's stills or whether that's video, it doesn't matter. It's like, what what is it that we're trying to achieve? What is it that like kind of turns us on? What is it that makes us really want to get up in the morning and go make more stuff? So as I got to thinking about this, I personally wanted to get back to why I started as a photographer. What was it that got me interested from the very beginning? This is a story I've never shared really on this channel. It's not that it's a secret or anything, but today might be a good day to go into this. Back when I was about 10 years old, that was the moment where I realized that photography was something I was very interested in and how that came about. So my father is an illustrator and his one of his best friends was a commercial photographer here in Dallas. In fact, he was not just a commercial photographer, he was probably one of the most successful commercial photographers in this region. Back in those days, the uh, city of Dallas was kind of a center for advertising. There were a lot of design studios here, there were a lot of ad agencies here, and there was a lot of work that people were doing in and around that segment. And Greg was enormously successful. He was a photographer, he was on the road probably 200 days out of the year. He was constantly out of town. He was an amazing photographer, a brilliant human being, very funny, very outgoing, and he was a very addictive person to be around. Anyway, I remember when I was about 10, our family started getting together, and I remember going over to their house for dinner one night, and they had this, this wonderful house, and they had photographs everywhere, and some of them were his, but they had this really great collection of little 8 by 10 ish sized framed black and white prints, and of course, I was 10 years old at the time. I knew nothing about photography. I didn't know who shot any of these. Of course, many years later, I came to recognize that they owned Henri Cartier-Bresson's and they had Richard Avedon's and they had Arnold Newman's and so on and so forth. Well, Greg actually started his career as Newman's assistant. He was one of Newman's assistants in New York, probably in the late 60s, early 70s, for a little while before he came to Dallas to open his own photography studio. We would go over to their house for dinner and they had a daughter who was my sister's age and they were a lot younger than me. So they'd go off and do their own thing. So I was a little bit left on my own because I was the only guy my age. And so I'd hang out with the adults a little bit, but I remember kind of helping set the table or get food for people or whatever. And you wander around the house and I remember there was this image that stood out to me and it was Arnold Newman's famous picture of Stravinsky at the piano or the famous B flat photograph. I specifically remember this image and I had no idea who Igor Stravinsky was. I had no idea who Arnold Newman was. This is simply this, this really, this black and white photo that had this way of just really pulling you in. And it was a, obviously a guy at the piano and I remember thinking that it was, it, I didn't know how to verbalize this back then, but it was the crop. It was the fact that that's a piano, but I don't see the piano. So whoever took that photograph was able to bring that in. I'm sure this guy probably plays the piano or something. I didn't know he was one of the greatest composers of the 20th century.
century. But I knew something was about with that image because of the compositional elements and the way that it just kind of spoke to me. And I was always obsessed with that. I remember I got to the point where when we would go to their house, I would go seek that out and I would find it. And it was just really inspiring and amazing to me. And it really spurred my whole interest of why I wanted to get into photography. From that point on, Greg became a mentor figure to me. I mean, he was my dad's age. We were really close family wise. And so, you know, there was that relationship, but I don't know whether he ever knew that or not, but I really did view him as my mentor. He would always be, he would always go way out of his way to talk about art and to talk about composition and to talk about photography and, and things that he was inspired by. And it was kind of a teacher, probably not intending to be. He was a really interesting person. And I got more out of that uh, growing up than anything else in my entire life. And I remember when I started to shoot, and I, you know, I'm a kid and I had a little point and shoot camera and I was really into it and I enjoyed shooting with that. But you had to save your allowance up, mow yards and stuff to be able to afford film and to be able to afford processing to get your pictures back. It would take a week sometimes. You'd go drop off your film and then you'd be waiting for the call when they said it was ready to be picked up and you'd go over there or you'd get mom to drive you over there and you go pick it up. And that was such a great moment. And I remember I couldn't always afford film just because that's how it is when you're a kid. And I remember Greg was telling me, well, don't ever let that stop you. What you need to do is you need to be practicing with your camera. Of course, this is kind of funny to say now in the digital age where that's not a concern. And certainly images aren't to be budgeted on that level. Uh, you have an SD card, you have a place to put them on your computer, you're good to go. But back then it was different. But Greg was always telling me to practice. Uh, this was the days before autofocus was common. And, you know, it was a matter of just taking your camera out, framing up compositions, getting in focus quickly and firing off the image. And it's funny because that's such a big part of learning to be a photographer that I kind of miss in some ways. It's like we just don't have that today. Just the technology is different. And so I think that we're not as forced to, well, we, we end up being a little bit lazy. We're not forced to be as creative sometimes. So funny story about Greg, and I did not hear this from him. I actually heard this from one of his assistants much later, uh, but it's a great story. So Greg was a successful commercial photographer. In those days, uh, Dallas was a big center for ad agencies. There were a lot of graphic design studios here, and there were a lot of people who worked in that industry uh, down in this part of the, the country. Back then, this was before the internet, the big bread and butter for any design studio was being able to get an annual report job from a large company. So back before the internet, companies would do what we called annual reports. These were these little booklets, probably mm, twice the thickness of a magazine, depending on how heavy the paper was. They usually were done very nicely because it basically was an outline of where the company had been, money they'd made, where they were headed, and it was supposed to be attractive. And so people would spend an enormous amount of money having these things produced. This was also so the days before stock photography was anywhere near what it is today and you would hire a photographer to go get custom photography for something like this which is kind of unheard of in today's age but that's the way it worked back then anyway there was a trip that greg had done and he and his assistant and for some reason the art director and the client were with them and it was for an oil company and they needed to shoot an oil rig with the sun going down in thailand i believe is where it was anyway they had to travel it was one of those things where you take one flight another flight then you've got to drive by a car with a local driver, then you have to walk a ways, then somebody else picks you up. Anyways, a lot of traveling. And I think the client is who it was who got really sick. So they were dealing with the sick client. It became kind of a babysitting situation and a little bit tense, as you can imagine. So they get to where they're going. Here's the oil rig. They've got the water around it and the sun's going down and then just the perfect shot. There's about 20 minute window to actually get this shot right. Well, the art director comes over, taps on Greg's shoulder. And he says, this isn't going to work. And Greg says, what do you mean? It's not going to work. We spent all this money. We've come all this way. We're going to get this to work. And he said, well, the reason it's not going to work is this could have been shot in Texas in the Gulf of Mexico. How do we know we're in Thailand? And he said, good point. So Greg looks down the way and he sees this fishing boat. It's one of those with the big bow on the front and really culturally puts you in the right location. And so he goes down there with a big wad of local currency, starts dishing it out and he gets his camera, gets on the boat and gets these two guys to go out. So you've got this huge bow of this boat coming up with the little oil rig in the background, boom, got the shot. That is one of my favorite stories. I've never actually seen the picture, but it's so descriptive, it almost doesn't need to exist because you understand the point. And if you've ever worked professionally, you know that it can be really high pressure sometimes. And I've just always been in awe of the fact that there are people out there that can think creatively like that under pressure and solve a problem. I think a lot of creatives, myself included, we tend to get into these ruts where what's in my mind is what's going to happen. I'm trying to figure out how to execute it. And I'm just glued into that idea and I'm never going to move away from it. And I think that's something that's we should all be striving to get away from. And I 
think in a client situation, especially when it's a non-photographer telling you something isn't going to work, that's not your initial reaction is to find a way to creatively solve it in the heat of the moment. And so that's why that's one of my favorite stories. So how does this relate to inspiration and what drives us and what we can be doing in this strange year of 2020? So I want to get to that in just a second. But real quick, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor today, who are the awesome folks over at Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people like you. It is a place to explore new skills. You can deepen existing passions and basically just get lost in creativity. Are you hold up at home? Spontaneous acts of creativity may help break up the routine of a day spent indoors. Explore some workshops and classes to help you get out of that rut. So one class that I've been looking at a lot this week is street photography, unlock the secrets of composition, color, and confidence. This one is taught by Craig Whitehead, who you guys might actually know. I've featured him on this show a number of times. He goes under the moniker Six Street Under on various social platforms. This class is excellent, as I would expect no less from Craig. He's a fabulous photographer with a really good understanding of the history of what's come before him, but he adds his own personal spin on the top. He is an excellent photographer. This class is going to teach you things like having confidence, preparing to shoot, being able to pre-visualizing the scene, capturing fleeting moments, playing with abstraction, making selects, editing, and everything. And so I really recommend this. Craig is an awesome guy. You may be able to check out this class absolutely free, and here's how. So the first 1,000 people to use the link below in this video will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning. So this means there's no ads and that they're always launching new premium classes so that you can stay focused and follow wherever creativity takes you. So use the link below, check them out, and learn something new today. And I want to give a special shout out and thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode of The Art of Photography. So how does this relate to inspiration in our own work? Most of us aren't shooting oil derricks in Thailand. I understand that. But as I mentioned earlier, this has been the strangest year I can remember ever. And we've all been impacted by this. Um, as I said, I was dealing with depression. So I put a lot of thought into what can bring me back around. And I think a lot of it is, for me at least, is my own work and improving my Myself and what it is that I want to do. And that's something that I don't talk about on here a lot, but it's something that I've been working a lot on really hard over the last couple months is getting the camera, forcing myself to try new things, forcing myself to just get excited about it again. And I've gone to great lengths to do this, but I love that story about creativity because I think so many times for us, when we talk about photography, it comes down to, well, okay, what is it that I'm going to go shoot? And certainly there are things that are more interesting to try to get out to shoot than other things. And as I mentioned, we tend to get bored with our own surroundings and it becomes very common. It's just not really exciting to us. And so how do we get over this? And it comes down to, well, what are we shooting? There's people, places, and things. These are what we call nouns. I mentioned this in the last video. One of the things that I've started to try to think more in terms of is less nouns and more verbs. So what is a verb? Well, a verb indicates action. So running is a verb. Um, this plate is a noun, right? So I can do a photo of a plate, but what is it saying? What is it doing? What is it going beyond? So how do we get a photograph beyond being an image of something static into something that actually communicates much further than that? That's the real trick to all this. And if you guys follow this channel, a couple months ago, I did a photo assignment and it's centered around still lifes. And I was talking about copying work of people that you really enjoy. And I think for me, anyway, that was a really important exercise. And not that I'm interested in copying Sudex work. I'll link to that somewhere around here if you guys are interested in seeing it. If you haven't, it was a lot of fun to do. But what I realized is that Sudek was photographing fairly ordinary objects, but it was his way of interpreting those things that, it's funny because the story I was just telling you about the oil rig and the photo shoot at sunset and the realization that that photograph could have been taken anywhere and they needed it to imply something else, I think that's what this ties into. Is It's like, well, I'm going to photograph something that could be anywhere, but how do I turn that into something that is a little more interesting than just what it presents itself to be in the first place? And then with this tells me is that it's not about the need to go somewhere exotic to get a photograph of something that all of a sudden is exciting. You can do stuff in your own backyard, so to speak. Maybe it literally is your backyard. Maybe it's just your living room or your studio, or your home or on your street. It's not so much what it is that you're photographing. It's being able to give it context. It's being able to give it a little bit of depth and it's the ability to take it beyond being that something static that I've been mentioning. But these are some things that I've been working on over the last month or so and there's some things 
things that I want to incorporate into this channel, particularly in photo assignments as we move forward. So the current photo assignment we have right now is pretty wide open. It's just the one lens for a month photo challenge. And there's not much around that other than restricting yourself to one lens. I want to talk about what we can do beyond that. And I think that's really important. I mean, let's be honest. We live in a day and age and have been for the last probably 10 years. It's just gotten really dire this year where we're marketed to by camera companies and people making things that we can buy. And of course, the sales pitch is always like, well, look, you can do more with this. In some cases, that is true. Some cameras do open up possibilities for things, but those are really usually pretty special case. And I think that photography is important to realize the creative side in your mind, in your eye, and what you're trying to do in the photograph. And that's what I want to start exploring more. Of course, I do camera reviews. People complain about that a lot. It's part of the channel. I do everything related to photography and I have for years now. But I do think it's important to understand with kind of a sober mindset where everything has its place. Yes, sure, a new piece of equipment, a new lens, a new camera, that can be inspiring in a way, but I don't think it's going to be inspiring in the way that it's going to create radically earth-shaking different work than you've been producing in the past. And so what are the kinds of things that we can put into this mix that do cover those things? I would love to hear your thoughts on this. So please drop me a comment below. I'll see you guys in the next video. Until then, later.